In this video, we will see 10 fundamental aspects about React in 10 minutes. Create Reactor. So the Create Reactor CLI is everything that you need to actually scaffold and configure a React project so you can get started and development out of the box without needing to go into the configuration details or doing that by hand or manually. So the Create React Top CLI is created by Facebook, which is the creator of React 2. So if you take a look on the GitHub page in here, you're going to find like as much information about it and how it works and all that. As it has so many stars, so many people love it as well. Among of them, me, I always use that to generate projects. So during your projects, you need to open up a terminal, Windows, Mac, or Linux, and you need to have npm install. Once you do that, you got npx, you're on npx, create, dash react, dash up, then you need to give it the project's name. And here you can name it whatever, like my, up in here or whatever like that you click enter it will stop the installation it will stop putting everything together from installing dependencies configuring and putting the webpack configs everything that you require will be installed for you by the create react top cli and you will have a ready-made react project and if you open up the projects using your favorite code editor you're gonna find everything that you need all the files and it's actually ready for you to start developing your react application the react dom so the React DOM is actually the second package that always you find alongside React. So whenever you find React on the web, particularly, you're going to find React DOM. So React is actually the main library that has the core features and has rendering and all the logic happening. But the React DOM is actually what allows React to render on the actual DOM or on the actual web browser. So this package in here allows the linking or allows the rendering of the React tree as created in here into a particular container. So for example, in here we're doing document.getElements.id and we're choosing the root element. If you go into our HTML file, we're going to find the root element is actually where we're going to be rendering our React tree inside. So we're telling it, oh, just grab me this particular element with this root ID and render everything inside between of these two divs. That's basically what the React DOM basically does. So whatever you put actually inside of that, for example, a text in here, hello from React DOM, you're going to find that that is basically being rendered. And if you take a look on the inspect elements, you're going to find the root directory or the root div in here. It has inside it exactly that. And that's what exactly the React DOM exists for. Components. So a component basically is a function or a class that renders something into the DOM. And by that something, I mean something that looks like an HTML, which is called GSX. So it basically returns that, and that is actually called the component. So it has a function, function name. It takes a props, which are basically like arguments in functions, but are more particular for React. So it takes that and it returns the div. And it, you can imagine yourself like returning a div in actual HTML. So div in here has some like class name in here, and it returns some text inside of it. And that's exactly what it renders. But the interesting part as well for the props, a props is actually an object that can have many properties of fields. So props in here is whatever you're going to be passing outside on the app is you can access it in here and you can render it exactly. So for example, the props.name in, in our case returns or actually equals to the on the browser. If we take a look where we are rendering the app, this is where we are rendering the app in here. And we're passing this prop, the name prop, which is exactly what we're using right here. We're passing it to be on the browser. So whatever you pass through this one, it will be available through the props. It's going to be an object and it will be eventually like rendered or used across the whole component in here, states and hooks. So basically a state is actually what allows the component to store the variables or manage the UI in order to update the actual UI look and feel whenever there is a data change. So for example, in here, we got this input variable, we got some like checkbox and we got a button. So this variable or this particular input, what holds is we are actually needing to input the username of the current user. So we're telling him, oh, please enter your username, but we can't actually hold that unless we've got a state. So to do that, we can actually use what's called hooks, which is a React feature that allows you to create state and actually manage it inside of a functional component. So simply to create hooks, all you need to do is, for example, create like use state in here, which is going to be imported from the React library. It's going to return the actual data variable, which is the username and a function that allows you to update that username, which will update the local state of this current like component. So the second thing here, we're going to have another function that's going to take care of that whenever you put something inside of this input of the username, we are going to update that with the current input's value. So it's just taking the DOM value, it's going to set it, and it's going to update the state. So we we'll also need in here to do like an unsubmit. So whenever we click on this button, we're going to show an alert that includes the current username, which is held into this particular state. And simply last but not least, you need to onto the component in here or the actual input components, you need to provide the value, which is the current username, and you need to provide the on chain. If you like, go ahead and submit that, you enter whatever in here, like maybe Alex or whatever, you click submit, and there you go, you get 
Alex, which is the username of this. You can enter whatever you got in here and the state will be updated and it all works fine using state and hooks. GSX. So GSX is actually what allows you to put or use HTML inside of JavaScript. So React can render that HTML as part of a JavaScript code and it will allow you to do a lot of manipulation alongside that. So for example, in here, if you take a look into this particular HTML file, which has like an image file in here, or just like an image element that has a class name, and it has an SRC of a particular image that is hosted in a web URL, and it has an event listener. So whenever you click on that image, it will basically show up in alert. As simple as that. So how can we convert this into using GSX and put it inside of React? So as we know, we have got a component in here, we're going to return something. So this is what an image is. So how can we put that? It basically shares a lot of aspects, but there's teeny tiny changes you need to pay attention to for GSX versus the regular HTML. So for example, in here, we got in here. So if you can want to do like the class name, there's no class keyword. So you need to replace this with a class name and provide that, which basically just corresponds to the class attribute in here in HTML. For example, you want to have the SRC, you just put the SRC. The on click in here, it's not going to be the same way because this is more like a string based, but since we know that JavaScript uses callbacks, so you can easily put a callback in here, you can have an alert, you can do whatever you want with it. You can do like different stuff, for example, on mouse over. So for example, in here, for example, if you go into like over the mouse, you see we get the console log because this event is being triggered. But if you click on this, we're going to get the alert, which is going to be triggered by this functional components versus class components. So functional components are the new standard since the introduction of React hooks. And what I mean by hooks in here is actually this particular function that we saw before to do the state, which takes a default value and it returns a destructible array that has a particular value in here you can listen for, which changes whenever you call that particular function. So what it does in here, you can have like other functions, which could be like closures in, in JavaScript. So you can like hold other functions, do a lot of, a lot of other logics or whatever, and eventually what you want to do is actually return some GSX, which is going to be eventually rendered by that particular component. So if you jump into the class components, they don't differ much from the functional components. But the main difference in here is clearly they extend the actual components and then have some methods like the constructor that needs to be provided. Otherwise, you won't work. So you need to call super in this. You need to have a state, which is like, you know, a global variable. You need to use this, which is a little bit kind of ugly. So you can benefit a lot from what classes can offer in JavaScript. But if you compare it to the function functional components, they are much, much easier compared to class components. Error boundaries. So error boundaries are special React components that allows you to catch errors inside of your components. So you can imagine them as the catch or the try catch in JavaScript, but they are made for particular React components. So a near boundary looks like something like this. It should be a class, it extends the React components, and it should actually provide or implements the get derived state from error, which is a method that allows you to basically get a particular state if it detects if there is an error. So this state will be returned in here, it will replace the original states. And on the rendering side in here, you can have the state and check, oh, if it has an error, please go ahead and display this h1 with where it awkward. So for example, in here to use an error boundary, we got you need to wrap up the error boundary, and whatever child is part of this error boundary in here is going to like this error boundary will catch whatever errors comes in the child. For example, we got this error component in here, which is I haven't commented. But if we take a look on it, it is just an error comp component that tries to access a profession or a property inside of this particular object that doesn't exist. This will basically go ahead and throw a JavaScript error that, you know, this particular error boundary will be able to catch. So if we go back in here, as you see, now we got both rendered because they were commented. But as soon as they save in this, it could say, oh, we're error awkward refs. So refs are a special way to access the instance of a particular component. For example, in here, we want to access the instance of this DOM component, which is the input components and access the vanilla JavaScript DOM methods to man manipulate that particular input. So to use your ref, simply what you need to do is like do use ref in here, which is going to be imported from the React library. It's going to return a ref instance and make sure to have this on top just for like, you know, a very usage. Once you've got that, you can go ahead and use this and provide it to the components that you want to have the current ref for. So basically here, what you can do with refs is you can access the underlining DOM inputs or the underlining DOM instance. So for example, in here, I'm having this on submit whenever you click on the submit button. And on this on submit, what I'm checking if the ref exists. So always ref has dot current in here, which actually going to give you the current instance of that particular input. And if it checks, oh, if there's no username or if the username is empty, all I'm going to do, I'm going to access that particular input elements or the instance of that particular input. I'm going to focus 
focus, which is a dumb method, which can allow you to, for example, oh, you know, you click on this button, it will refocus on this particular input because it's actually empty. But if you enter something on it and click on that, it will pass through, it will run the alert that's created in here, context. So a context is actually a way to share state between one or multiple components as a child without explicitly passing them as props. So for example, to create a, like a context in here, you use React, you do create context, you can pass it a default thing in here, but we're leaving empty and that's actually our context instance. So you can export that. And if you go into your components, for example, we've got this component in here, we grab in the context and we do like, oh, I want to access my context in here. I want to access the provider. So every context should have a provider and the provider takes a value that's going to take that particular value, which is currently this particular object and it's going to provide it to all the children inside of that particular context, which we means it will be provided into the image components and the details components without explicitly passing through as props. So if you go into the image in here, we actually access the username. We use use context hook. We pass it our context we want to access and it's going to grab us whatever data it's actually inside the context. And remember, the context actually has the username. So we're actually getting the username in here and we can just like go ahead and render it. So you say username, username, and that's actually what's equals to high Porter. So if you go back into this, you go to the details, it's going to be the same thing, extracting the username, and that's actually what it looks like. So the details component inside of here, it will access the username. We're not passing them through but if you've got like a chunk on a lot of data, context will be very, very useful for you to pass that chunk of data to a lot of components, especially if you've got like functions, different variables, objects, JSON data, yada, yada, yada. You can use context to make it a little bit more easier for you. Environment variables. So environment variables are a special kind of variables that are being passed through from your machine or whatever the environment the app is actually running on into the actual React application. So for example, to set up and create an environment variable, you need to define a .env file, which will act as a source for all the environment variables. So for example, in here, what you can do is actually you can pass, for example, oh, I want to pass my API URL, which equals to something like localhost 3000, whatever. So a React application can know the API URL. So that's mainly or mainly what it's actually used for. So for example, in here, this one will pass through because we're doing oh info and maxing this, we're actually displaying. If you go back in here, we're actually accessing through the process. env. We're doing React up API URL, and that's what you get in here. If you go back into this, since this one is not prepending the React up, as you see, we actually, even though we are accessing this, we're getting an empty value because the create React up is stripping this off.